very much, uh, Annika, also for highlighting these three very exciting areas and, and for really, you know, pointing out importance, not least for an organization like SCI, to also carefully listen to and in interface with the policy side, people who are actually working on the policy issues on a daily basis. And you can give you, us your experience, what works, what doesn't work, and what is key for you to, to really push things forward. Can I ask uh, those two colleagues that were already mentioned now, Mons Nilsson, the research director uh, of SEI, um, and Johan Schillenschana, the famous uh, part of the Schillenschana <laughs> twins. It's just amazing. <laughs> um, We've heard now these two um, presentations or um, about the science policy and what is key, uh, why science is so important, but also a little bit of some of the challenges that we, we have uh, moving forward. Mons, your perspectives, you are, you are linked to some of these projects that not least um, Annika mentioned as well. What, what is your experience and what do you think we could actually maybe do better as an organization moving forward? Well, I, I think the first thing is that, um, as you said in your introduction, we have 25 years of experience bridging science and policy, and we're getting better at understanding what it means and what is real policy impact. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first step. And, and it's actually the, what, what might be considered the usual way of thinking about policy impact, where there's a study and it has a direct hit in terms of changing a decision, it's actually very rarely the case. Uh, much more often it's more a long-term conceptual change in the way that the, like the interpretation of the framework where people think, um, which you might call some sort of atmospheric impact perhaps. Um, uh, that, that I think, but the problem for us is that we can rarely claim credit for it because we are a part of a bigger constituency that, that uh, is uh, pursuing that question. And there's also a third type of impact, which is actually um, maybe underestimated, and that is the way that we provide uh, strategic ammunition for the Ministry for the Environment, for instance, in its deliberations with other ministries or with, with the EU or within the UN, that through the evidence, arguments and models that we can um, um, sort of um, provide the, the, the basis for more sustainable decision making. Um, I think uh, what we've done maybe a little bit too much is to uh, support the ministries for the environment and the environmental interests in society. And as Charlotte points out, the, the, the main um, decision making sometimes occur in other fora. And to reach the finance ministries and to reach the investment managers in the, amongst the institutional investors, we need to speak their language and, and ask the questions they are asking in our research. And that's what the new climate economy is actually about to try. That's a high risk. We're not sure they're going to listen, but, but uh, maybe the stars are aligned this time for this argument to take place. But if you take that as, as a starting point, because this is, of course, something that is important for us when we move forward, because exactly as you say, um, the impacts are coming from other parts of society, and, and we have to really engage with them, and SCI is engaging more and more with the private sector as well. Um, but moving forward, what will be important? Is, is it just a matter of changing the language uh, when we communicate and discuss with other key actors? Or do we have to change, you could say, our set of arguments uh, more fundamentally in order to influence uh, the policy and development drivers of society? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's partly um, uh, staying true to your vision and, and believing in, in sustainable development uh, on a fundamental level, but also to recognize this complexity of interests and values in society. And that if you're talking to people concerned with budgets or security or public health, they have to get the knowledge about how, for instance, a climate mitigation strategy will affect their interests. And, and the common way that they have been used to addressing that question is to go to their analysts in the uh, you know, macroeconomic research institutions and they get certain types of answers there which are incomplete. And we're not saying we're, our answers is, is uh, totally comprehensive either, but it provides an angle on these factors that I think will add a lot of value. And we've only started, I think, to probe that question 
in the new climate economy by providing the synthesis of what we know about the impacts of, of climate mitigation on jobs, on growth, on innovation, on security, etc. So this is, the, I think, a, a research program that we have to invest further in into the future. Thank you very much, Mons. Uh, Johan, um, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition was one of the initiatives uh, mentioned in the shortly climate pollutants. This is an area, among many others, that you have been focusing on for quite some time. And suddenly we have this you know, trigger. Some, suddenly we could move from what has been a quite long scientific de debate and discussion, trying to push for change, and suddenly we have that shift. How do you see the role of science there, and also then the shifting role you know, being really at the sort of upstream and now suddenly being in the center of the policy making processes as well. Well, it was, it was interesting to, to see where we are now and um, to see how the, our engagement started with this. So um, initially, I mean, SEI has been working on atmospheric issues, both climate change and air quality ever since SEI started. So there's been a long term engagement and um, the, the sort of impetus uh, or, or our entry point to this issue um, started with something called the Global Atmospheric Pollution Forum, which we um, developed to try and get some global dialogue. One of the things we did, we got some money from CEDA to hold a meeting in 2008 in Stockholm on the co-benefits of, of, of dealing with air quality and climate change at the same time. And one of the messages which was coming through consistently was this short-lived climate force uh, focus, that there were a number of um, pollutants which both acted as air pollutants and where you could get a climate benefit in the near term. So um, then we, we also had been involved in the UNEP geo process in the atmospheric chapter, and we had one of our colleagues from UNEP there at the meeting, and he went back and talked to some other people and then rang up and said, well, do you think there's, it's time to do an assessment of these short-lived substances and we thought, yeah well that's a good idea you know seems to be a lot of inf information and interest so we started down this process of developing this assessment with UNEP and then also with WMO um, at the time we didn't actually know um, what impact it would have um, and it was a journey um, and the journey partly I, I think there are some issues which we can pull out from that and one is that um, we were able to galvanize a really good team around the assessment because of our networks. We had existing networks built up over a long period of time. We could get the sort of really good people involved. There was also a question of, of um, the way that we developed the process focusing on solutions. So um, as Annika mentioned, the issue of we identified measures. It, was, it could have gone various different ways. I think that this, the scientific literature on these short-lived um, pollutants had been very much in terms of oh, what are these substances doing in the atmosphere and so forth and there was some interest in for example the ABC program it was in the press and so forth but it didn't have the the sort of like the, the, the focus that the assessment gave I think which because we focused on the solutions we said look if you do these things 16 measures implement them everywhere you will get benefits and also this focus on the benefits it was very much the air quality as well as the climate change. And if you look at the countries that have joined the CCAC, some of them are joining from a climate change perspective, but many of the developing countries are joining because they have, in Asia particularly, but also increasingly in Africa, um, really bad air quality problems. And that's sort of killing people, it's destroying their livelihoods. Um, and so there are various entry points for the decision makers. Um, so I think that we, we, we managed to take a complex problem but simplify it to the point where the decision makers could say, okay, so we trust the science, so trust is a really important part. Um, it, we have to make sure that, as a general point in, in SEI, we have to be credible so that the decision makers can trust what we say. And um, we also... I think with all of these things, it's like we didn't know that it was going to have the effect it had. But there were some people involved. So in Sweden, we had Andreas Karlgren and Lena Eirk really took this, and Annika, really took this issue forward. And at the same time, UNEP took it up to the highest level and pushed it. 
But we couldn't have known that when we started on this thing. But that there was sort of like the right people were in the right place at the right time, and then it had a big impact. So um, these are some of the things I pulled out of that process. I don't know if Annika, if that resonates with your view, because you were on another, the, the policy side of this. It, it does, definitely, and I think it, it came at the right time as well, because we were then in the aftermath of Copenhagen and the climate negotiations, and I think that countries were also very much looking for um, complementary efforts and action-oriented efforts, things that could be done now. While we are still continuing to focus on the negotiations, we want to do things now. And so that came very timely. So it's not just the content and how it's packaged, that it was, you know, it, it was a list of actions that you could implement and you knew that that would be solutions to many of the problems you were trying to, to resolve. But it was also that it came at the time when people were looking for these kind of concrete actions and solutions. So it's the timing as well. But maybe a question, Johan, slightly back to you, and maybe also to you, Charlotte, working on sort of development cooperation. What tends to happen sometimes, I mean, now in SCI, we have a lot of research which is linked to this very complex problematic of shortly climate pollutants, everything from household energy systems really up to the global policy level and, and global discussion. When, when it becomes an international issue such as this one, isn't, is, isn't there a risk that you sort of lose the connections to the reality on the ground. You said very much, Charlotte, we have to really always focus on the development which benefits the poor people and actually beyond poverty because nobody will be satisfied with just being brought out of poverty. How, how can we ensure that there is a very clear connect between these global policy processes and development on the ground, that whole interface? How do you manage to keep that uh, within the work of CEDA, for instance, that connection? A million dollar question. No, but first of all, well, we, we have uh, three overarching priorities where <coughs> uh, climate and environment is one, uh, and, and obviously the other ones are equality and human rights democracy. But we are fighting poverty with these um, values, if you, if you will, uh, mainstreamed in everything we do. And, so what we're trying to do is, is when, we, uh, when we try to get women empowered through uh, agriculture, for instance, we also try to use uh, clean energy. I mean, new, new solutions that are not uh, old ways of doing this, but we really try to get uh, in the innovation and, and practices that are kind of doing the right things to start with. And I think we should be able to communicate those on the ground examples much more than we do. But may I also uh, give an example of, of, of maybe kind of, a, of between very much on the ground and more global. We, we think uh, that it's, it is important to be solutions uh, driven in the way you communicate this and know your target group. Uh, <clears throat> because the more you know their driving forces, the more you know how to communicate and the more you will get an interest around that. So you have opportunities uh, which you can kind of surround by, by knowledge. We are investing in something called the African risk capacity, uh, which is an, an, an insurance against weather-based disasters. We are focusing on, dr on draft, uh, no, Drought, thank you. Drought, that's beer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, not, no, that's not what we're doing. Uh, but, and, and the interesting thing is that we combine the new ways of working with new financial tools around an issue where we really see a problem. But it's an African bank. It's not us uh, trying to find the solution. And around that initiative, there is so many opportunities to communicate more knowledge around the issue as such. And people will start to think, well, it's good that we have an insurance against, against the problem, but it's very short term. So what, what do we need to do to think more long term? That's the opportunity to really grasp projects uh, that are interesting, new innovative projects. We need you to kind of be there and, and build on those solutions and, and inform uh, the decision makers even broader than the project as such, because they will then influence others. So I think we should be concrete and use the opportunities that we have on the ground 
uh, a bit more together. Thank you very much. We're actually now uh, hitting coffee break. Coffee. Not, not, not no. But later tonight, draft it's coffee. exact draft coffee. But, but I must say, I mean, you know, there are many things uh, that really could be discussed. But this was a very, very short session, uh, although it's really key for us to continue this, this dialogue. What I, what I pull out really, um, it's not a major change from the past, but maybe it's articulated more clearly, is the fact that we must really engage with a lot of actors that we may have not reached very well before. I mean, we, we understand more and more that the change makers out there from the private sector, from other ministries, and unfortunately the environment ministry, um, those are the actors we must, must reach. And that requires a bit of a shifting thinking, both in terms of language and arguments and so on. But, and I know this sounds a bit sort of naive, but having this solution-oriented approach all the time, I think, changes the way you are approaching issues and, and problems. And from the start, you are actually addressing them from the perspective of trying to find viable solutions for different key actors. Uh, and I think this was not clearly uh, the success, as you uh, described, Johan, from, from the climate and clean air, or the development of the climate and clean air coalition. We must find solutions. We don't have a choice. We can continue to focus on the problems, and they're really nice and so on, and complex and require a lot of data and so on. We as scientists love them, really. But we must find solutions. We don't have that much time to, to sort of hang around. Yeah. So thank you very much to, to the panel. Thank you very much, um, Annika and Charlotte, for, for joining us here this morning and actually for helping us shaping our focus discussion for the next uh, two days. This was really, really very nice. And also, of course, to listen to Johan and Mons makes me feel so yeah. secure that we are moving in the right direction. So that's really great. So thank you very much to the panel. Uh, we are going to have a coffee break uh, very soon. Uh, Eric, you want to say something? What I can do, just before you, if you wait for one second. Uh, first of all, Andreas, I've seen wait, you. One moment. One moment, please. You won't get coffee if you leave now. Um, Andreas, uh, I was actually introducing our board before, and for some reason I didn't see you then. Now we have two board members here. We have Shashni Nibleus, who is chairing SCI's board. Whatever success you would like to attribute to SCI, it's of course Shashni and the other board members. Andreas, uh, our one also our distinguished board members, is almost two years back now. So, do we have other board members here? No. Okay. Thank you. Then I also would just want to highlight our centre directors, because if you want to talk to people from different centres, you should do so. But it would be nice if the centre directors can stand up so people can see you. If they're not here, they know that they are in trouble. We have Thea, uh, we have Lisa, we have Stacy, we have Charlie. Uh, yes, we have Ruth. Where is Jacob? I'm here. There is Jacob. Good. Ta uh, Asia, Eric. Did I miss someone? Good. So, we, we are going to have coffee, but first, Eric. Sure. But it's not just coffee, it's also a poster session. Yes. So, in addition to the spoken presentations, people are also uh, showing their posters. Posters are set up out there, so at first the presenters, the poster presenters, will have a chance to get a little coffee themselves and some tea, but then I would ask uh, the presenters to go over to their posters, and I would ask all the rest of you to go and walk around and talk to them and ask them questions. Thank you. And 10.30, please return here. Thank you very much.